Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to the Analysis.News podcast. And please don't forget, we have a matching grant campaign on now. Uh, a generous member has put up 10,000 bucks. So if you donate now, or if you increase your monthly donation, or you create a new monthly donation, uh, he'll match it. The monthlies are going to get matched uh, for a year, so times 12, whatever you do on your monthly. Uh, thanks for joining us. Be right back. As President-elect Biden assembles his cabinet and prepares to take power, President Trump, while more or less conceding without conceding, is planning his next act. One way or the other, the almost 74 million people who voted for him will continue to be a base of support both for Trump and future right-wing demagogues. That is, unless the Biden administration actually deals with the vast inequality that has developed over decades but much of it during the Clinton and Obama administrations. Of course, we shouldn't overlook the Bush-Cheney gang that let loose the dogs of Wall Street in an unprecedented fashion, but Trump and the current incarnation of the Republican Party has found a way to distance themselves from the economic mess left by Bush. Still, why did so many people vote for a lying con man and a delusional megalomaniac? Many of those that did vote for Trump wouldn't disagree with my characterization of him and voted for him anyway. Others believed he was chosen by God in spite of his flaws. You know, all humans are flawed. Many just like lower taxes and hate the Democratic Party. So what do we know about from the data so far about why this election was even close? And what will Biden be facing as the pandemic worsens and the economic crisis deepens? Will the Fed keep the stock markets flying in the face of all reality. Now joining the podcast is Tom Ferguson. He's a professor emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Thanks very, very much for joining us again, Tom. Hi, uh, Paul. Nice to be here. <laughs> so start, start with uh, the 74 million people. What do we know about them from the data? Okay, look, here's the, uh, we know, I think, a fair amount. Unfortunately, much of what is claimed people know isn't true, which makes this discussion difficult. The general view of the 2016 victory, you remember that, um, was uh, in sort of the major papers uh, and overwhelmingly in the scholarly community, especially in political science, was that Trump won on racism and sexism. And I mean, there were folks, there was even a Nobel Prize winning economist that was openly mocking people that thought that economics could have played uh, any role in this. So I'm going to repeat uh, a few things I've said to you before. Um, I got so disgusted with that uh, refrain uh, that some colleagues and I, Ben Page uh, in particular, um, and we went out and actually broke open the American National Election Surveys to actually look at the survey data. I mean, I hadn't done that for years, even though I once was the assistant to the guy who was then taking the New York Times poll, though I'm not claiming to have taken the poll. I didn't, but I was his assistant. Um, and what we found was pretty straightforward and not a huge surprise. You bet racism and sexism were important in explaining people's decision to vote for Trump. But a lot of people who voted for him uh, didn't like him that much at all. They thought he was, if you like, uh, the lesser of two evils. Uh, they didn't like Hillary Clinton either. And there was a solid block of economic concern at there, really important. In particular, um, a lot of people like tariffs, though it was hard to see uh, when you start looking at people's responses to questions. You ask them, do you like free trade? Yeah, they like free trade. That sounds pretty good. Then it, when you probe a little further, well, they also, what they really mean by that is some, some notion of fair trade, uh, which you know gets a little woolly, but it's not anything goes. Um, and a lot of folks liked plain old tariffs. Um, now, interestingly, you know, you can look in vain. I have looked through the various exit polls this year, uh, which are beset with problems, because while they uh, evidently tried to sort of deal with the mail-in vote, 
they probably didn't succeed too well. And they were, of course, off in their predictions, but they can adjust afterward. I don't think that makes those polls useless. Um, but you will look in vain for a question about tariffs uh, anywhere in there. Um, and, you know, you don't have to be a genius to have figured out that Trump in the last week and a half in particular, and at various points in the campaign, including his acceptance speech, were pitching the revival of American manufacturing. And that was, he spent a considerable amount of detail on that. Now, um, what I'm doing uh, right now is with my colleague, G. Chen and Paul Jorgensen, we're looking at uh, the county election data. That's beset by problems, too, including the fact that it isn't all in. I mean, people keep coming in with more votes, not in a fraud sense. It's just there, it takes them a long time to count. I mean, anybody who deals with election data seriously knows that you know many states don't report their full totals, at least in the old days, through up to January, actually, when they had to be, sometimes be certified. Anyway, there's enough in there. And I think you can see it's pretty obvious that uh, what the Washington Post and others are telling you is just close enough to the truth to be seriously misleading. Um, that is to say, they are saying, well, you know, the really well-off areas voted for Biden and the slower growing ones uh, mostly went for Trump. <clears throat> what we're finding basically is this. In the counties that grew very slowly or not at all, in particular, I'm using here now population growth as an index for that. In other words, if you were adding a lot of people because you're growing, um, you were very likely to have a uh, heavier anti-Trump vote. But uh, the Trump vote is strongly boosted by and of the in counties where they're not growing much or hardly at all. Um, in other words, they've been losing. They've been in decline for a long time is my uh, simple take on that. The other thing you notice, uh, and here you got all kinds of people sort of, I think, missing the point. If you take a look at what Trump's economic policies uh, did, just in terms of actual income coming to people between uh, basically uh, 2017, 18, and 19, what you find is that those where those areas' unemployment rates went way down, they were much more likely to vote for Trump. Now, this point bears expansion, and uh, you can see that it will be affecting uh, sort of what the Democrats, incoming Democrats, will do. The, uh, it's not a secret that Trump kept pressuring the Federal Reserve to keep rates down. Now, people tend to forget. Uh, that right after the last election, last presidential election in 2016, lots of Democratic economists, not everybody, but a lot of them, and a, a very large number, of course, of Republican economists were demanding that the Fed hike rates. They said we were at full employment. You know, I think I did an interview with you where I just dismissed that as nonsense. Certainly a lot of other people did, too. And it's not like Trump was sitting there trying to figure out the Phillips curve. He just beat them uh, up um, and just held them down. Now, they did raise rates sometime, but for sure, they didn't raise them as fast as they wanted. And the result was those unemployment rates went down, down, down. Soon we were listening to complaints from even some Republicans and a lot of businessmen. Wages are rising. We can't find workers, to which the short answer is, well, you know, you could raise your wages a little bit. And they, you know, just kept coming. We never exhausted that pool of, if you like, reserve labor. Um, COVID finished that off. I mean, and that's why looking at the time periods when you measure really matters. I mean, then it threw the whole uh, United States into recession. But it's obvious that people got the point that they were, um, in effect, finding jobs and their wages were rising for the first time in substantially in a long time, in a lot of places. And it was also what Trump said, um, which was true, which was that blacks, Hispanics, all kinds of groups out of labor markets that had been, you know, there were all these, there were even theories, it went to sociology, which I never advise or almost never. Um, you got theories about why these people culturally didn't want to work or something like that. They were all out there. They were finding jobs. I'm not telling you they were great jobs. They were not. 
Um, but you could get working hours for the first time in a long time. You could make some money, and people did. Now, what we're finding in our studies is that's a really the combination of coming from a slow growth area in the form of depopulation and uh, really showing a big drop in the unemployment rate up to the moment when the economy collapsed, uh, or really 2019, uh, is really powerful. And I would just broaden this. At the bottom of a a uh, huge amount of the gap between perceptions in this country right now is the uh, calculation by lots of folks that uh, the people running the Democratic Party just didn't care very much about. It. Now, my colleagues and I, in our 2016 paper on voting, we actually went in and you know looked at the evidence on people who had dropped out of the electorate between 2012 and 2016. Um, in other words, they voted for Obama, let's be precise, and then didn't vote, or they voted for Trump. And people, they were saying, you know, we can't see any difference between the major parties uh, there. I mean, there's a lot of turning, a lot of people were turned off. I would add, too, there's a hinterland aspect to this that's important. Um, in the uh, sort of mainstream Democratic Party thinking, um, which is heavily affected by cl the climate change thinking, uh, which I'm not trying to tell you the climate isn't getting worse. It's gotten a lot worse, and we've got a serious problem. You know, just I just tell people stick your head out the window and inhale during the wildfires wherever you were, even in Europe, you could you were probably inhaling some of it. Um, but for 20 years or so, lots of environmental regulations that got put on had the net effect of pulling out of use land in the West mostly doesn't pull much land in the east out, though occasionally it does. And that, you know, particularly in timber areas and um, really far out peripheries, it circumscribed people's allowable economic activity. And those folks resented it. And you could see the differences over time as nothing was put in its place, as nobody made an effort to sort of like even get the internet out there in a large way. I mean, the Democratic Party just had hardly all, almost nothing to say to those folks, uh, except, I guess, move to the cities or something like that. I mean, there was this long controversy when Howard Dean was trying to get the party to reach out in every state. You know, that was famously ended um, there. Um, and so, uh, bluntly, a large chunk of the population gets the idea that Democratic elites don't like them very much and that their policies don't do much for them. Under Trump, that did change, not in the sense that it was, I mean, in general, the Trump economic policies were terrible for the income distribution, and they were terrible for growth in the economy, um, if you like, in the aggregate. But they did have this sort of short-run cyclical component that did push up wages, um, and that's really powerful. That's, gonna, that's kind of like an alpenglow. Uh, I suspect after the sun goes down, is going to resound out there in the hinterlands, unless Biden does something quickly to convince people that he gets it, uh, which is going to be hard given that he's got a divided uh, Congress uh, and he's likely to take office, not like Franklin D. Roosevelt did with all the banks closed, but with enormous numbers of people either directly sick from coronavirus or recovering, including some of them with the so-called long version. Uh, a lot of people say, and including people on the left, uh, that the Republican Party, and, and Trump tries to says the, say this too, is becoming more the party of the working class. Uh, but but this is the thing is that the big cities didn't vote for Trump, and the big cities are majority working class. No, that's right. More broadly, uh, when you look at the polls, now, one problem is it's tough to look at the polls. I mean, I have a big problems with the way these polls are presented. They do it in pieces. You can rarely see the whole poll. And a lot of reports are collapsing the income categories um, so that you can learn almost nothing. If you do, if you look all over the place, you can sometimes come up with better People will do better uh, groupings. Okay, the most illuminating one is this. 
is that in the lower, the two lowest income categories I've seen, um, the Democrats actually, as as usual, this is a pretty common thing for many years. They were still the getting um, the majority of the votes, counting between the two parties. Um, there, if, if people voted at all. In the grouping from 100,000 to about 200,000, also from 50 above to the, the, the Trump support was substantially larger. Um, and particularly about, between about 100,000 and my memory on this is about up to 200,000, it was quite heavy. Now, these are not working class voters in general, I think. Um, but they are not, uh, they're not the 1% either. A lot of them for sure are running their own businesses uh, or things, or they are in, you know, very small enterprises that, uh, you know, a trucking firm or something uh, at the executive level, not at the driving level, where they're likely to belong to a Teamster, and I guess are more likely to have actually voted for Biden. Biden took most union votes on average, although in states, I have seen numbers uh, raising some severe questions about particular states, notably in Pennsylvania. Um, I, I, I'm, I would like to see a better presentation and fuller on that question. Um, it's pretty obvious that a substantial number of unions in say uh, coal and uh, oil um, we're not keen on the Green Green New Deal. We're not keen on Biden and may actually have supported, at least some of their members have pretty heavily did, um, some of the Republicans. This business needs some clarification. Um, am I correct that my understanding is not that the Republicans won the majority of the working class, just Trump was able to win a, a little more of the working class than traditional Republicans do, and that in 2016 was decisive. But then it seems like he lost at least some of that in this uh, current election. He actually, my memory on this is he actually did a little better among people making 200,000 plus, not hugely. Um, I mean, in general, the, the big point about these election returns is they don't vary all that much. They vary just a bit, but not a lot uh, from 2016. But um, as best as I can tell, what's going on uh, in the um, uh, sort of middle levels there um, is it's really a sort of regional or rural section. Um, it's, it's not entirely clear to me who's doing what in there, but the notion that they're working class, no. And there was this Hispanic swing against uh, the Democrats in part, I mean, the percentage of Hispanic voters that went for Trump has been, was substantially larger than people had expected. That wasn't universal. In particular, what you will look, when you start looking at this, everybody mentions Florida and Texas. Now, that's pretty interesting because I'm being told by people down in Miami that the Democrats down there did not mention minimum wages hardly at all in their campaign. Uh, I have not seen that discussed in any press report. Uh, instead, we hear stories about how well we all thought that they were Hispanics were going to vote for um, Biden, and they didn't. Well, what exactly was said down there? Uh, I think bears some uh, analysis. Um, if my friend's claims are true, and I live down there and we're watching TV, that's really interesting. In Texas, I'm looking at that myself with my colleagues. And there, what I'm finding a pretty straightforward interaction between oil and Hispanic percentages of the population. <clears throat> that's clear. On the other hand, the swing in Texas and parts of <clears throat> other states are bigger than that. Um, now, what I actually think probably happened there is that along the border where construction was a big deal for the wall, a lot of contractors basically did what they would do as a matter of fact, if they were on the other side of that wall in the South, they'd simply told their workforce there isn't gonna be um, <clears throat> any more contracting jobs if we stop building the wall. Um, and I can't find anybody <coughs> discussing this. It is testable. My colleagues and I are trying to test it. Um, but um, 
right, I'd say the swing among Hispanics is bigger than that. And of course, out in some places, Hispanics did vote heavily in Biden. That usually gives people a chance to do the bromide that, well, they're, of course, a diverse group. Yeah, they are. Now let's, so tell us about what keys, what the diversity. I mean, Hispanics were really important in Bernie Sanders' victories out in some of those areas against Biden. So the short of it all, it's about the economy, stupid, even though there may be all kinds of cultural issues at play here. Not maybe, there are. The interaction between the economy and culture, I think, is extremely important. I think it's directly testable. And stories that identity politics drives this stuff, frankly, they're just stupid. Uh, I mean, there people need to sort of do a little thinking. Now, I can't resist adding this, Paul, knowing that we've talked about this. You want to know what the religious swing is that really helps Trump yeah. in this election? Now, you haven't heard this anywhere else. You haven't seen it. It's in the Mormon books. You say, what? Um, the answer is, uh, if you remember back to 2016, I did because I, I I was actually working on trying to predict this. And I realized Utah and these other states were way off. On, is you The Mormons were in 2016 quite skeptical about Trump. Now, it's not like they became enormously enthused. It's that they became sort of normalized uh, in the intervening four years. And so what uh, we find in some of our uh, studies is that, the well, the you can see it directly in the Utah vote. It was just more, it went sort of normal Republican for Trump. He wasn't normal Republican in 2016. That shows us a big jump. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'm not trying to tell you that uh, any angel came down and told anybody this is really the worth of God. That's not what I think. But I think they they were handed a choice between uh, Biden and uh, Trump, and uh, they sort of appreciated him by then as eh, not uh, maybe not really a normal Republican, but they went for it in normal Republican tendencies. <laughs> So if, if the issue going forward, clearly for everybody, but if the 74 million people that voted for Trump, uh, the issue of the economy is going to be critical. And Biden's in this position of having two masters, if you will. It's not new for the Democratic Party, but it may even be more extreme now. Finance uh, seems to have preponderous, preponderantly, is that a word? The majority of finance money, Wall Street money, seems to have gone to Biden. Uh, they seem to, what they wanted apparently was the Biden presidency because they had come to the conclusion that Trump was nuts and not trustable. And they want a Republican Senate. We'll see if they get what they want uh, some, in early January. Uh, but what, what Biden's going to be facing, this calamitous situation of uh, the deepening pandemic, deepening economic crisis, and the only way he's going to deal with this inequality crisis is some really transformative stuff, which Wall Street ain't going to like. They probably don't mind infrastructure projects if they can find a way to make money out of it, and I'm sure they can. But they're not going to want higher wages. They're not going to want the kind of unionization that Biden was promising in the election campaign. Uh, so what's your take on, you know, What's necessary? What What do you think Biden's likely to actually do here? Well, okay, this is pretty tricky, but let me start with the question about what finance did and uh, actually did. There are all kinds of reports in the last six weeks of the election. There were people who should have known better writing articles about how the whole business community was moving toward Biden. Now, a substantial number of people clearly did that. But, you know, when I read those articles, I was laughing out loud because you could see straight away, for example, vast numbers of energy sector folks, a good chunk of healthcare, uh, people in paper and other heavily polluting industries, chemicals, they're very unlikely to have gone uh, against the Republicans at any level because the pollution issue is still huge. I mean, my colleagues and I, you know, Paul Jorgensen and Ji Chen and I, We've all sort of shown you in 2012 and 2016 
the importance of all these polluters as the basis for a Republican, a large, large chunk of Republican finance. Now, there are also lots of claims that the Democrats were massively more supportive in total campaign spending. Those might be true, but those reports were coming from reports filed before the election and before the final week and a half or so. It's just the case that in the final week and a half, you usually see a almost literally exponential growth in um, financing coming in. And in 2016, there's no question, we showed it in a uh, piece there that attracted a fair amount of attention that for, in particular it saved the Senate for um, the Republicans and it almost certainly helped Trump uh, win because in effect they were just pushing the whole ticket in the final days of 2016 and it was and it was a close election. Now we know that some late money into Maine from private equity folks helped turn the main election, the Senate, main Senate results around for Collins, the Republican. That's I think clear, but we don't know what the rest of the situation looks like. We'll find out in December, and at that point, I'd feel a lot um, more confident about assessing stuff. It, I think it is clear that a good chunk of Wall Street backed Democrats. There's enough on the record that you can see that. Um, and thus, you size it up pretty well, I think. Uh, you know, this is going to be very tricky. And I would add it's all infinitely complicated by the fact of the COVID problem. Because, yeah, you are coming in not only with a deep recession, since the COVID aid ran out, was allowed to run out at the end of the year. Um, but you are also going to be coming into a country where people are literally getting sick at a, I'm sorry to say, exponential rate. Um, and it's spreading like crazy. And, you know, the country has nothing in place to deal with that at all. I mean, it's just plain. The U.S. rates now look among the very worst in the world. I mean, uh, Philip Alvelde, John Mallory, and I just published a piece on that, an INET that's bounced all over the planet that's even being translated into French. Um, that sort of shows you how crazy the American state responses have been. Um, and so the Biden folks have to come up with an effective coronavirus response. They have to sort of try to fix the economy, and they got to do it pretty much all at once because they can't do this in pieces. The uh, in 1994, Clinton got his head handed to him when he talked, you know, he was, he literally did talk about national health insurance, then switched the subject um, there to first it was gays in the military and then famously that other health care plan that Hillary Clinton was said to have crafted. Um, and then Obama, you know, did not do the big stimulus that uh, he was advised by his own economic advisors, uh, not all of them, of course, famously not by Larry Summers. Um, but the um, now Biden's got to do something, and he's got to solve all of this at once. This is a very tall order, and I have this bad feeling here. Um, I mean, the scorched earth policy, I mean, I can't read what uh, the Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin, did except as a scorched earth story, particularly on the question you're looking, uh, it's just a fact. Yes, the government did give some money to help uh, states and localities for COVID expenses, but their general expenses are, uh, rather their general revenues are collapsing because of the economic downturn. And, you know, you can't sit there, you can't contain COVID without fixing up your transport system. It takes money to sort of put in the right type of air filters, those so-called HEPA filters and things like that. People know how to do this. It's not overwhelmingly expensive, but you gotta do it, you gotta do it promptly. When you pull like the state and municipal facility, which was, was operating with prices set so high that just it made almost no sense for anybody even to try. And I think they made two loans. When you set that out and when you cut out the whole, or not the whole, many of the, I think they cut out the so-called mainstream thing. You will note that the more some of the more general programs apparently survived for Wall Street. Um, the, uh, 
you can't fix this thing. You can't, I mean, you do not need the economic collapse of a bunch of cities right in the midst of coming to power uh, in the middle of a, um, a, a serious pandemic and, you know, with plenty of climate implications too. I mean, in case, you know, the wild, wildfires aren't burning in January, but they'll be around next, uh, next fall. So what does the appointment of Yellen at Treasury tell us about what Biden might be planning? Well, it tells you there's some rationality there, actually. I mean, I'm, I, Yellen did move the Fed away from those crazy old uh, non-accelerating um, inflation rate models, you know, Phillips curve type stuff. Um, that's to oversimplify. She did push that along and they began to sort of experiment. On the other hand, uh, you know, it was, it's the Fed. Um, and they were slow on uh, a lot of consumer and just income distribution issues. But she's at least sensitive to that stuff. Uh, most of the other Democratic candidates for that, I think, who were practical, I didn't see them. Um, that suggests to me that somebody is still somewhat rational there. They know they can't just sit there and go completely with the old Clinton Obama policies. On the other hand, what are they willing really to try? I'm not sure. If the Republicans do con continue to control the Senate, how much can Biden do through executive order? How much can the Fed do uh, without the approval of Congress? Well, the Fed can do a lot without the approval of Congress. And you could read. There's an enormous debate about this when the when the uh, so-called 13-3 Federal Reserve provisions were rewritten in the wake of 2008. Um, but I, as I read that language, it would still justify a lot of things and in an emergency, almost anything. But you know, we could all debate it forever. People are debating it already. But, you know, fundamentally, if the Fed wants to keep doing what it was doing in the last few months, they need somebody to sort of give them a loss cushion, which the Treasury was providing. Now, that's apparently been withdrawn uh, there. Um, the sort of fundamental Here, hang issue, on, though, Hang on for one sec, just for people that don't may not know this. The Fed's not, yeah, the Fed's can't take a loss. So how does the Treasury give them a loss cushion? Just gives it, they had that uh, fund and they were going to let them absorb. That was going to be any losses would have been absorbed out of that, which means the, the Fed would have had to send less money back because it typically sends a lot of money back uh, to the U.S. government. But the bigger story is this: is uh, people here, just like in 2008, are all walking around saying, "Oh, it's just terrible. The Republicans will control Congress, will control the Senate." and uh, nothing can be done. That's not really true. Um, if a deter you know, There were some efforts to push on Republicans, but Obama mainly didn't do it. He was trying, and I see he was defending himself the other day. Well, you know, the truth is they blew the first two years and they brought you to 2010. That really stuck gridlock in the system and brought you Trump. Because they didn't, they did everything too little, too late. I mean, that's let's repeat that. That's you got Trump because of the Obama administration failures um, in economic policy. Now, um, in the case of uh, Biden, the president's got real power to persuade. Uh, and if you know you're sitting in the middle of a deep recession, uh, if he goes out there and says, "Look, we really need this." And he's got, uh, it would be helpful if other groups would get in behind him. Uh, but I, I don't, you can at least make the effort. You know, there's nothing like TV ads in uh, states where Republican senators are up for re-election in two years. They didn't do, they did a few of those, just a little, but hardly any. Um, they don't have to sit there and be passive. Uh, and just say, oh, that's really bad. Mitch McConnell won't get along. Everybody vastly is exaggerating what you can do if somebody wants to make the effort. We haven't seen anybody make the effort. Clinton did not in uh, 93 and 94. Neither did Obama. Yep. By effort, you mean spending the, the money to persuade people that the senator blocking support that might come to your family. Like, but also, any names. Now, look. 
if you read the daily press accounts, you will hear typically, well, I mean, just read the accounts of what was holding up uh, the current action on uh, trying to renew the, uh, what the, the Cures Act, the, the um, spending programs. Um, and they rarely carry it down to any granular detail. Like we were told that several Republican senators objected to uh, having wages too high. Tell us more. You know, I mean, basically, reporters don't they they don't write very much more than what they are handed on a fork by somebody. I mean, the one thing's got to say here. Yeah, I, I'd like uh, a free press and I'd like one that's factual, too. It, it beats you will forgive my plain English here it beats Fox News. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, you know, you're a long way from that in the United States. That's why I'm talking to you, uh, and as it were. I mean, we're not, you know, you're not going to see me on any major network any time in my life, I don't think. Um, and uh, the truth is, is that the press just won't cover this stuff. They will cover it. The rules, they, they all follow very clear, implicit rules, sometimes made very explicit, um, uh, where they will, if a a um, some politician in power actually says something, they'll usually cover that. Not quite always. Um, we saw some very interesting things coming in the final weeks of the election. But in general, they'll cover it. Uh, but what typically happens is that the press is given briefings on all sides for public purposes that are very general. They don't name names. You can't find out that say, I mean, uh, oh, I remember one that was wonderfully topical. It's nicely back in the news today because he just got appointed yesterday to the climate. But I remember when John Kerry held up, tried to ban, and I think he succeeded in banning the use of the Dartmouth Medical Atlas to sort of drive down costs in the medical sector back when they were doing the uh, legislation on cost controls in Obama's thing. And you know, that's ridiculous. Uh, nobody, they didn't report that in the Boston Globe for years. Let me ask you, uh, is it, uh, sort of to, to wind this one up and we'll talk more again soon. Uh, sure. do, do you see any indication that the Sanders, Warren, AOC uh, part of the Democratic Party, and that's a big part of the Democratic Party when you look at the primaries, right. Are they going to have any influence in this administration? And, and if they don't have much or any, well, what are they going to be the repercussions of that? Well, my reading of what's going on right now in the, I mean, there, this is to get more detail than we have time for. I'm conscious of the fact that we need to wind up. I could see that the Biden people are listening a bit there. I don't regard this as all a zero, at least not yet. Um, I also think that that wing of the party has not really engaged. They've been defending themselves, which, of course, for since they were under attack. I, I quite get that. But, like, they ought to be championing a sort of fairly straightforward, uh, high-tech uh, approach to COVID. They're all pretty quiet about that stuff. I mean, I'm not, not, I'm not hearing the sort of things that folks should be doing. I'm just pushing testing, though the Biden people are coming late on this, and they came late to the OSHA integration of that. Um, but they are now doing it. But they, that I, I'm not hearing the type of economic stuff, except we can spend anything we want, which is actually clearly not true. I I am not the only person. Lance Taylor and other folks have all made the point about modern money theory. You can, in fact, change, put your currency at risk. Now, we're a long way from that. We're not anywhere near that right now. Uh, but in the next few years, you're going to see one inflation scare after another. You're going to see all of these funny things, flight to gold, which you saw uh, somewhat earlier. Uh, all this stuff. People got to sort of get their economics. Uh, frankly, they're a I, I, my my sense is is that the macroeconomics and the COVID responses are frankly a little behind best practice, and, and that they sort of need to get their act together. Um, and they're going to have to sort of solve this problem of. I mean, it's absolutely clear that we have a severe race uh, racial justice problem in the United States. 
They have got to do something about that, and it's one of the glories of that wing of the party that they're you know, spotlighting it. They also have to deal with the vast number of other Americans who've seen, you're, you're pauperizing people uh, of all colors. I mean, it's an equal opportunity pauperization scheme right now in the way wealth and income are being redistributed under this um, pandemic recession. Uh, and folks got to address that in very broad terms, and they got to do it fast. And they have to deal with the fears of large numbers of folks uh, when they start to do major programs that they'll just turn themselves into Weimar Germany or something. Now, you don't have to do that. I've, I've written and done a lot of work on Weimar. We're not there yet. You're, you're, uh, you're talking about hyperinflation that... There's certain, yeah, certain, yeah. no, I mean, certainly no there's sign of any enormous, inflation right now. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there, there's enormous, except in food. Look at food. You will see the food prices have risen in rather fast, actually. Um, but the as, uh, as have grocery store profits. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Look, in general, uh, if you set up a situation where you are subsidizing firms uh, but not workers. Uh, you're going to create a lot of unemployment. People got to go to work. Uh, they go to work even if they get sick, and firms continue to make profits. This is a really ugly sequence. But my my point is, folks got to think in broad terms quickly um, on because you got enormous numbers of people who are getting pauperized, and they're going to have to sort of reassure folks who are afraid. Uh, I mean, the whole upper middle class vote that turned so heavily, that's a place where I think you can see some change, not an enormous one. It's pretty small, but it mattered uh, against Trump. Uh, and they're on COVID, I think, as much as anything else. I mean, basically, Biden was sort of a very reassuring uh, teddy bear for folks who were anti-Trump. You know, if it had been Bernie Sanders there, I'm not sure what would have happened. I was a strong Sanders supporter, uh, but um, the and I also wonder about all these business execs who, in the last few weeks, urged a peaceful transition and to get tell Trump to go home to um, Florida. I have said which is I yeah. Guess, they they may now. not have done that if it had been a Sanders. If, if we're thinking that they would do that for Sanders, yeah. that's would be an interesting discussion, yeah. wouldn't it? All right. But it's not to All right. Well, thanks for joining us, Tom. We'll do it again soon. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news podcast. Please don't forget our matching grant campaign. Just go to the homepage. It explains everything. And uh, thanks again. Mm -hmm.